Lessons from the Titans by Scott Davis Book of the Day Summary Subscribe for daily book summaries What companies in the new economy can learn from the great industrial giants to drive sustainable success? Learn about the rise and fall of giant industrial companies. Why do some companies fail while others succeed? To answer this question, people commonly point to new tech companies like Uber or Airbnb, which disrupt old industries. But the truth is that the culprit is more often an arrogant management culture. While some companies might appear to collapse suddenly, their declines are usually years in the making. In this summary, you'll learn about a few industrial companies that have stood the test of time, often going from rock bottom to the very top, and vice versa. They reveal which management decisions led to growth and profit, and which undid years of hard-won progress. You'll also discover how certain metrics, like disciplined cost management and humble corporate cultures, contribute to these shifts. In this summary, how General Electric acquired NBC for free, why Boeing lost $50 billion developing the 787 Dreamliner aircraft, and why nobody wanted to be Honeywell's CEO. Key Idea 1. Jack Welch's RCA deal helped propel GE to industry dominance. In 1986, Jack Welch announced General Electric's purchase of electronics company Radio Corporation of America, known as RCA- to the tune of $6.3 billion. But GE already had a consumer electronics branch, and the deal left Wall Street analysts scratching their heads. When Welch had taken over as CEO of GE in 1981, he'd inherited the century-old company's bloated management structure. He spent the next few years cutting costs, and that strategy had worked wonderfully. Headcount was down 25%, while annual revenues were up 30%, to $37 billion. But still, the RCA deal just didn't make sense. But what analysts didn't foresee was how Welch would use the deal to grow GE like never before. The key message here is, Jack Welch's RCA deal helped propel GE to industry dominance. It was just one part of RCA that Jack Welch had eyes for, the TV network NBC. So he sold RCA's other assets, as well as GE's consumer electronics branches, for more than the cost of the deal. GE made a profit, keeping NBC basically for free. Then Welch used this extra cash to bet on growth projects. The first of these concerned air travel. Noticing the rise in globalization, Welch predicted an uptick in demand for frequent flights between cities. Airplane manufacturer Boeing perceived this trend too, and upgraded its 737 plane accordingly. Sensing opportunity, Welch outbid competitors and took over the contract to build the 737's engine, the CFM-56. Together, GE and Boeing improved the 737's fuel efficiency and reduced engine noise, and by 2020, GE had sold over 32,000 CFM-56 engines, making it one of the top performing products in American history, and GE's chief moneymaker. Jack Welch's second big bet involved boosting the efficiency of the F-Series power turbine. Demand for electricity varies according to the season, so they designed the F-Series turbines to handle these seasonal spikes, to keep up with demand for air conditioners on hot days, for example. On days with lower demand, the surplus energy is used to power steam turbines. Since these turbines last for decades, GE's service costs turned it from a low-margin sale into a high-margin product. It was a clean alternative to coal power, and had investors scrambling to get a piece of its long-term profitability. Key Idea 2. GE Capital's success wasn't sustainable. During his 20 years as General Electric's CEO, Jack Welch took a lot of risks. And for the most part, these ended up being very profitable. Welch transformed GE's corporate structure, increased cash flow dramatically, adopted the Six Sigma quality control system for factories, and got rid of everything he viewed as dead weight. By the year 2000, GE's market capitalization had reached $600 million. In 2020 dollars, that would be the equivalent of $1.34 trillion, just above Apple's, Microsoft's, Google's, and Amazon's respective market caps. But at the same time, this period of outsized successes created the arrogant corporate culture that eventually led to GE's fall from industrial stardom. When Welch retired in 2001 and handed the reins to his successor, Jeffrey Immelt, GE was already in decline, and a major contributor to it was its financial lending branch, GE Capital. The key message here is, GE Capital's success wasn't sustainable. GE actually started offering some form of lending services in 1932, providing loans for consumers to finance purchases like refrigerators and washing machines, eventually forming GE Capital in 1943. But in 1984, Welch and GE Capital's head, Gary Wendt, decided to take a more aggressive approach to growing the extra cash that GE's industrial businesses were bringing in. 
Unlike financial institutions, which were highly regulated, GE Capital had barely any regulatory oversight holding it back. And its AAA bond safety rating meant that investors could lend money through capital at cheap prices but receive higher yields than U.S. government bonds. By the 1990s, capital was lending all over, from financing private equity to leasing aircraft, railcar, and medical equipment, and even issuing store-branded credit cards. When Jeffrey Immelt became CEO in 2001, capital was raking in 40% of GE's total earnings. By 2007, capital was responsible for 55% of earnings, making it an especially risky venture. But there was one side of this success that was kept behind closed doors. In the 1980s, Welch had figured out that GE could basically decide when and how it would report gains and losses. If GE's businesses had a less than stellar quarter, they could pump up the total earnings by including those from GE Capital. And if Capital's earnings needed a boost, that could come from revenues from the other core businesses. This gave the appearance of steady profits and made success look inevitable on paper. And although the true numbers were much more volatile, Immelt and his managers relied on this creative accounting to justify increasingly risky projects with no immediate payoff. Key Idea 3. Jeffrey Immelt perpetuated a company culture that deterred criticism and favored big ideas over practical investments. In hindsight, GE Capital's shady accounting tactics played an important role in General Electric's decline. They also made it appear sudden, even while cracks had already begun to reveal themselves. GE's financial statements puzzled even the most experienced analysts and debt rating experts. And yet the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, never stepped in. GE was just too big, and as the company expanded, its lobbying clout did too. Jack Welch had created a culture in which questioning him or his managers was discouraged, and Jeffrey Immelt allowed those beneath him to maintain that culture. While GE continued cooking the books, this environment ensured that protecting GE's image, and Immelt's, took priority over anything else, including manufacturing quality. And any ethical concerns? They took a back seat. The key message here is, Jeffrey Immelt perpetuated a company culture that deterred criticism and favored big ideas over practical investments. GE's culture of hubris and intimidation extended well outside of the company's internal sphere, and soon, what it started as lobbying became threats. For example, in his first year covering GE as an analyst, the author, Scott Davis, received a daily phone call from an investment banker, who would remind him that GE could ruin his career prospects if he made any missteps in his financial reports. Davis wasn't the only analyst to give GE's stock a buy rating as a result of these scare tactics. And as more and more investors bought shares, thinking it was a surefire path to profit, they were actually pumping up a bubble that would eventually burst in the 2008 financial crisis. GE found itself hit especially hard by the economy's collapse, in part because of all the debt it had taken on through GE Capital. In 2009, Immelt eliminated GE's stock dividend, which some shareholders, including GE retirees, relied on for income. The share price had gone from $60 in 2000 to $40 in 2008, and by 2009, it was just $6. If the US government hadn't stepped in, and Warren Buffett hadn't made a clutch investment to revive the company, GE likely wouldn't have survived the crisis. In recent years, GE has regained some credibility, but questionable acquisitions have kept it from making a full recovery. When it purchased Alstom Power for $17 billion in 2015, for example, Alstom turned out to be near bankruptcy. This essentially sealed the deal for the end of Jeffrey Immelt's controversial tenure as CEO. Key Idea 4. Efforts to reduce Boeing's risks and improve profitability had mixed success. In the summer of 2007, Boeing had high hopes for its brand new, high-tech 787 Dreamliner airplane, which it planned to unveil on July 8. But there was just one problem, the plane was nowhere near ready. The wings were even missing segments. In the end, the first 787 didn't take its first test flight until 2009, and customers had to wait until 2011 for their first planes. The 787 didn't actually become profitable until 2016, and by then, Boeing had lost over $50 billion. In response, CEO Jim McNerney announced a plan to get Boeing back on track that he called the risking the decade. The key message here is, efforts to reduce Boeing's risks and improve profitability had mixed success. To reduce Boeing's risk and liabilities, Jim McNerney dictated that the company stop taking on any new high-risk projects. He also eliminated contracts that were losing money. Then, when Dennis Muhlenberg took over as CEO in 2015, he devised a plan to boost Boeing's profits from around 5% to numbers in the teens. All these strategies had an effect. From 2010 to 2018, the company's cash flow rose from $3 billion to $15 billion. 
A key part of Muhlenberg's plan involved lower manufacturing costs, so he asked external suppliers to lower their prices. As a negotiation tactic, he began insourcing Boeing's airplane parts. Creative bookkeeping showed that Boeing's own factories were 30% cheaper than suppliers, though most likely the opposite was true, as suppliers had spent years optimizing manufacturing processes, something that was difficult for Boeing to replicate overnight. This became a problem when Boeing aggressively expedited the manufacture of the 737 MAX passenger aircraft in 2015 to compete with Airbus's A320neo aircraft. But the MAX came with a critical defect, MCAS, the automated flight control system. In flight, MCAS forced the nose of the plane downwards to keep it flying at the correct angle, but at low altitudes, pushing the nose down meant crashing, and that's exactly what happened to two MAX planes in 2019. That same year, Boeing's new CEO, David Calhoun, tried to turn things around. Existing MAX planes were grounded. But Boeing believed that once the MAX was recertified, orders for it would come pouring in, so the company took on billions in debt to keep producing new planes. Unfortunately, 90% of all planes were then grounded because of the COVID-19 pandemic, interrupting the plan. Key Idea 5. Dave Cote revived Honeywell by cutting costs, developing new products, and expanding into new markets. When Dave Cote received the offer to become CEO of Honeywell in 2002, it wasn't because of his talent or experience, it was because nobody else wanted anything to do with Honeywell. And no wonder. The company's factories were in disarray, it was facing multiple lawsuits over asbestos liabilities, and it owed rising debts. As if that wasn't enough, Cote became CEO in the aftermath of the economic decline following the dot-com bubble. Yet even with the odds stacked against him, Cote managed to turn Honeywell around. By the end of his tenure, it had achieved a market capitalization of $125 billion and employed over 114,000 people. The key message here is, Dave Cote revived Honeywell by cutting costs, developing new products, and expanding into new markets. Cote started out by hiring Dave Anderson as CFO in 2003. Anderson got Honeywell's shaky accounting in order, and soon reached settlements for most of the asbestos lawsuits. At the same time, Cote took a multi-pronged approach to transforming Honeywell's other problem areas. The first step involved cutting costs. Normally, this would mean trimming headcount and shutting down factories. But Cote actually hired quite a few new people, limiting most new hires to specific areas with large growth potential, such as business jets and environmental products. Between 2002 and 2016, headcount increased by 15%, while profits and revenue increased by 75%. Rather than reducing costs by outsourcing manufacturing, Cote focused on localizing production. If the products were sold in the US, they were also made in the US, if they were sold in China, they were made in China. Since Honeywell also wanted to further expand into China, Cote suggested not only that Honeywell's local factories employ local people, but also that they be run by locals and use local suppliers. To improve productivity across the board, Code incorporated better manufacturing practices and quality control benchmarks into the Honeywell Operating System, or HOSS, which provided factory managers with tangible metrics by which they could measure performance, such as defects per million units, and delivery time punctuality rates. Most RAND funds were also reserved for high-growth products, such as software to make airplanes more efficient, or developing more environmentally friendly gases for air conditioning units. All of these strategies together, along with an aggressive campaign of acquiring and selling smaller businesses, led Honeywell from a profit margin of 11% in 2002 to around 20% in 2017, the year Cote retired. Key Idea 6. Mike Neeland turned United Rentals around through reforms, continuous improvement practices, and regional cooperation. The first few industrial businesses we've looked at develop and sell products to customers. But United Rentals does neither of these things, it rents out industrial equipment to other businesses. Many companies don't use machinery like aerial work platforms or industrial dehumidifiers all the time, and it doesn't make sense to buy and maintain something that only gets used once or twice a month. So there's clearly a market for United Rentals services. Yet when Mike Neeland became CEO in 2008, the stock price had gone from $20 a share to just $3. Neeland intended to reverse this trend, though, by making the most of the Great Recession's lousy rental market and restructuring the company from the bottom up. The key message here is, Mike Neeland turned United Rentals around through reforms, continuous improvement practices, and regional cooperation. For its first 11 years, United Rentals was united only in name, it was the result of over 200 acquisitions of smaller rental companies, and each branch operated mostly independently. One reason was the compensation schemes for branch managers. Before Neeland arrived, 
managers were compensated based on profits before expenses. Essentially, this compensation scheme encouraged managers to buy lots of unnecessary equipment, even if it wasn't immediately in demand, instead of saving money and borrowing the equipment from a nearby branch. But by tying 70% of managers' compensation to district rather than branch results, Neeland promoted greater cooperation between branches. Next came pricing. A standardized pricing system didn't exist. Prices were generated on a case-by-case -case basis using mobile devices. Neeland introduced new IT solutions to digitize and centralize pricing, contracts, order-taking, and insurance policies. Lastly, he focused on improving operations and establishing a culture of continuous improvement, making extensive use of Kaizen, a Japanese business philosophy that values improving everything a little at a time. Between 2014 and 2015, United held over 500 Kaizen events, workshops that helped find efficient solutions to tiny problems. For example, they found that it saved time, work, and space to prepare equipment for a delivery in advance. When a truck entered the rental yard to pick it up, the driver just had to find the correct spot, load up the truck, and leave. These systems becoming optimized meant that when United acquired four of its competitors, they were easily integrated into the existing procedures. These improvements took time and effort, and they weren't free. United Rentals debt rose from $3 billion in 2008 to $12 billion in 2018. But its profits rose much faster. Key Idea 7. The most successful companies manage costs and risks, increase cash flow, and effectively deploy capital resources. Companies like Uber and WeWork might operate in fundamentally different industries from General Electric and Honeywell, but they have also run into the problem of profitability and responsible risk management. As it turns out, the so-called new economy of today has a lot in common with the old economy dominated by industrial businesses. And the reasons why a company is successful, or fails, often boil down to the same basic principles. In fact, there are a few key commonalities between General Electric, Boeing, Honeywell, United Rentals, and their peers. The key message here is, the most successful companies manage costs and risks, increase cash flow, and effectively deploy capital resources. One thing that successful companies like Boeing and GE have in common is their use of lean manufacturing systems to manage their risks and costs. Lean is a system for reducing waste during production, and successfully incorporating its principles often results in faster production rates, higher quality, and fewer defects. When Honeywell incorporated lean principles, the improved productivity that followed also meant less risk, increased cash flow, and higher profit margins. On the other hand, by not paying attention to its manufacturing systems, General Electric suffered during Jeffrey Immelt's stint at the helm. Immelt's team very likely took on increasingly risky gambles to try to compensate for this drop in productivity and quality. Another part of minimizing risks involves finding and keeping the right talent, which means consistently promoting a humble but pragmatic company culture. When CEOs are asked what makes their company so great, they usually mention their people. But not everyone can have above-average talent, so it's even more important to create an environment of continuous improvement for everyone. As Dave Cote from Honeywell said, it's essential to compensate the good ones for both the work they do today and for the job they'll be offered tomorrow. And finally, investing capital responsibly might seem like a no-brainer, but it's best to stick to the numbers. Invest in deals that will make money. Mergers and acquisitions have played a central role in the rise and fall of large industrial companies. But as we saw with United Rentals, acquiring hundreds of companies doesn't automatically translate to increased profit margins or market share. It's important to invest in companies with a tangible return, and to stay away from those failing businesses that will just bring the rest of your company down. Final summary The key message in this summary is. We have a lot to learn from these older industrial giants that have experienced ups and downs. General Electric has gone from being one of the largest companies in the world to the brink of insolvency. Boeing eventually managed to make its 787 Dreamliner profitable, only to suffer a deadly manufacturing defect on its 737 MAX that would claim many lives and Honeywell and United Rentals went from scrambling for survival to having two of the most solid outlooks of any companies today. By analyzing the triumphs and failures of these companies and others, we know that cost management, efficient systems, and effective use of cash flow are crucial ingredients in long-term success. And here's some more actionable advice. Focus on improving average employee performance. When leading a business, it's tempting to obsess over star players. But by putting most of your eggs in just a few baskets, you're making sustainable success highly risky, with low chances of reward. It's okay to have a few champions in the top 5% of employees, and you'll also have to weed out the bottom 15% of destructive talent. But long-term success comes from average people boosting performance a little at a time. 
If the middle 80% of employees improves by just 10%, it generates three times the impact as your star is improving by 50%. Subscribe for daily book summaries.